How do we navigate the way forward? Five thought leaders weigh in. This is the Issues Watch podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Issues Watch podcast. I'm Don Meyer, Chief Marketing Officer at the New Jersey Society of CPAs. In June, we were thrilled to return to the Borgata in Atlantic City for our convention and expo for the first time since 2019. More than 560 people attended the 38 CPE sessions and numerous social events. While we were there, I had a chance to talk with five of our keynote speakers about how CPAs can prepare for the future. In this episode, you'll hear from Gene Marks, CPA, columnist, author, and owner of the Marks Group. Donnie Shimamoto, CPA, founder, and senior member of Enterprise Technologies. Keisha Williams-Smith, CPA, assistant professor, and director of the Master of Accountancy program in the Department of Accounting and Finance at North Carolina A&T State University. Jim Burke, CPA, partner, director of firm technology, and managing director of advisory services at Witham. And Scott Clemens, CFA, partner, and chief investment strategist at Brown Brothers Harriman. The theme of our convention was transform, innovate, grow. But a lot has changed since we developed that theme at the end of 2021. So I asked each of our guests what accounting and finance professionals can do to prepare themselves and their companies for the mega changes coming in the next few months and years. Here's what Donnie, Gene, Jim, Scott, and Keisha had to say. The only constant is change. And for our profession to really move forward, it's we need to continue to innovate. We need to continue to transform what we're doing, how we're doing that. And all that is really driving growth in the profession itself. They gotta be investing in tech because that's where most of the changes are gonna be happening, Don. There is, um, there's just a, an, an overabundance of new cloud-based and workflow and AI technologies that are coming out on the market that are gonna be impacting all organizations, whether it's a CPA firm or actual individual companies. So, you know, you know, how do you prepare for that? You know, like uh, most of us are like, you know, we, we don't know, it's not what we do for a living. Um, the best advice I've been giving my clients and people in my community is you got to talk to your vendors that you're getting something from. So, you know, if you're a Microsoft shop, if you're a Google shop, if you're getting stuff from Intuit, if your ADP is your payroll company, you know, whoever it is, you need to be talking to those vendors because they're the ones that are working on the tech for you. And when people ask me about like, oh, I should be investing in AI or workflow and I don't, you know, what do I do? they're doing all of that stuff right now. And they want to make sure that their clients are happy and their customers are getting that new technology. So you, you got to be proactive with your, with your technology vendors. You got to be asking them, this is what I've, I'm using of yours now. How can I be using it better? What else do you have coming out to help me make my business run more productively? What are we telling all our staff, our 2,000 people that we have across the country and outside the country? We're telling them to think out of the box. We're telling them to think differently, right? What you did last year, you know, you're starting an audit, brainstorm, you know, we used to take what we did last year, replicate it, do it, do it all over. Throw away what you did last year, right? Technology is totally changing everything that we are doing. So you talk about transform, you gotta transform everything you do, whether it's tax, whether it's audit, and whether it's our entire profession getting into advisory. When it comes to clients, we're telling clients the same thing, right? Embrace change embrace technology, embrace, you know, look at Witham differently. Witham is not, and CPA firms going forward are not just firms that do your tax returns or do your test work, your compilations, your, let's say your audits, your reviews. We Think of us to handle, be the solution providers on all those things that you would otherwise buy from third parties. Come to us, right, CPAs, we're your trusted advisors. So we'll do anything for you. Let us know, we'll figure it out. If you think about where we started this year, Don, I mean, I don't know if anybody had Russia, Ukraine on their dance card, inflation was already an issue, but between now and the end of the year, you've got budgets, you've got a midterm election. I mean, who knows? Which reminds me, in my career as an investor, really all we're doing in investing is trying to find companies with competitive advantages. In my entire career investing and advising companies, I have only ever encountered one truly sustainable competitive advantage, and that is the ability to learn faster than your competition. That's it. Yep. So if you can invest in making yourself or your uh, members can invest in making their clients a truly learning organization, change is not a threat. Change is an opportunity because it enables you to increase that competitive advantage. We are moving at the speed of light, uh, but that's where innovation happens. That's where necessity is happening. So in terms of get prepared for that, I really think that 
professionals need to stay as current as they can just with the business trends. Uh, what is happening, I know is probably preaching to the choir, but if you're not reading a business periodical every day, multiple times a day, just to know what is happening, and then also think about how you can upskill uh, with data and technology. There are so many different technologies that allow us to visualize information, to allow us to aggregate information, go out here and take some of these free courses. Some of these entities have trials or, you know, through this organization, they're micro learning and all this good stuff. I believe there's an emerging issues track in terms of CPE. So really trying to stay ahead of the game, thinking about uh, what is gonna come. Well, in order to think about what's gonna come, you kind of have to know what's happening. So I would say the upskilling becomes being very connected to what's happening in the business world. Uh, also making sure that you're upskilling your technical skill set, And because what got us here is not gonna keep us here. And so those are the things that we can think about, uh, try to upskill, you know, what's your personal goal list? I mean, a lot of us, if you're like me, uh, you got a little bit of gray in your hair, and you're like, well, I have great skills, and what do I need to do differently? Well, we should always be a continuous learner. So what type of self-assessment are you doing to say, okay, where am I a little deficient in this area? What do I need to really upskill? Because the more you can do to get yourself prepared for either the technology trend or the current business economic environment, then you can think creatively about client solutions. You can think creatively about how do we provide assurance for some of these things, but you kind of have to get in the game. This is not a passive activity. You kind of have to get in the game, find those learning areas, find those opportunities for you to uh, improve yourself and enhance some of that skill set. And I think that will put you in better position for whatever is going to happen next. I had an interesting discussion with Donnie about the fact that CPAs are not always known for their willingness to embrace new technologies. So CPAs have never been known as uh, early adopters or let's say comfortable adopters. So what do you tell CPAs to make them more comfortable with implementing and utilizing new technologies? So that, that's actually a really good question. And actually, I think it's a misnomer that we are not adopters of the new. When you look at our profession compared to law, compared to medicine, from a technology adoption standpoint, we are way ahead. Look at our presence on social media. We were there up in the front, you know, especially with like AICPA, Tom Hood, like they were really pushing things. When you look now at the use of artificial intelligence, when, at the use of automation, like we've got it embedded throughout all of our organizations, throughout our firms. So it's actually, you know, we, we're there. I, I, I think it's this, it's the same way like we think a lot of people think of us as that bean counter like that is not our profession right our profession really helps people be more successful whether that's in business whether that's as an individual and so really it's driving all of this forward and and, and adopting those and actually wait let me grab this i just i just did a session this morning on how to identify opportunities for automation uh, and out of use of artificial intelligence. And I asked, after I had explained like, this is the ways that artificial intelligence automation is used, I asked the audience, uh, how worried are you about being replaced by artificial intelligence? 43% said not worried at all. And that's because they're operating in that, especially our CPA space, that higher professional level compared to just the bookkeeping, right? If it's bookkeeping, auditing clerks, those are gonna get automated out. If you're working at a professional level, applying judgment, using your objectivity and independence to help clients make better decisions, you're not gonna get automated out. The next one was mildly worried, 47%. If we add those two together, that's 90% are really not even worried about being automated. So if you really take the time to understand the technologies, you actually will get excited and I actually have the data. The next question I asked them were, how do you feel about the impact of artificial intelligence on accountants and auditors? And 74% said, I'm excited about the impact and the changes it will bring. And another 9% said, this is gonna be a significant boon to our profession. So 74, nine, 83% widely resounding is like these technology changes are a good thing. Because again, they're going to get rid of the, all of this like menial stuff, which is the stuff that people think about with us, like it's the ticky tying and doing all that stuff. Like all that's going to get automated out, and it's really this more fun, interesting, 
like innovative work that we're doing that's really going to be driving us forward. Now, do you find that um, there's a discrepancy in the way that practitioners think depending on the size firm that they work for? So uh, larger firms absolutely have embraced AI. Um, I think it sounds scary when you say AI as opposed to artificial <laughs> intelligence. But they've embraced AI because, as you mentioned, it gets rid of those menial tasks. It frees up people yeah. to do more meaningful work. But I wonder if, you know, New Jersey has 3,000 small practitioners. Um, do they worry more about it because some of what they offer to their clients kind of falls in that, I don't want to say menial, but, it, you know, it's a lower level. Are they more worried about being replaced by, by AI than those larger firms that look at it as a real boon? So, so this audience was actually a mix. It was about half large enti larger entities and companies, and but there was a mix of small and large. And this presentation that I did this morning, like I've actually done this across, actually not in just across the country, across the world, and the the answers are pretty consistent. So, no, I generally am not seeing that. And in fact. Uh, you said like more larger companies. We actually see more resistance in larger companies because it's a much bigger change for them, right? The beautiful thing about the cloud and this, this like software as a service thing is that now Microsoft, Amazon is providing these type of technologies to even small companies. And in our small business accounting world, the products there are actually embedding artificial intelligence behind their products. So QuickBooks Online, Xero, like they've got AI embedded into the transaction coding. So you don't have to actually know how to use AI to actually reap the benefits from it. The, um, you know, the, the software vendors are actually doing it for you. So we see it in the lower end, we see it in the higher end, the SAPs and the Oracles. What's missing right now is the mid-market, unfortunately. That, that's actually where we see the least adoption, but that's more because the vendors are not quite there yet. Here's what Jim had to say about helping CPAs and their clients embrace new technologies. Change is hard, right? But there's so many tools out there that literally make our job easier, right? Here at our, at our uh, conference, we heard a lot about bots and AI and machine learning and the power of all of these tools combined together. Well, what are those tools doing? Those tools are doing all of the manual tasks that we did as, as, as accountants, as CPAs in the profession, right? So we're, we're simply taking it to the next level. We're saying, you know what? We're going to automate all those manual tasks, those tasks that, that, that really were a huge burden on our entire profession for the longest time, and now we're going to put the professionals in a much better position to better advise their clients, you know, use their brains, take things to the next level. So that's what it is, embracing all of these tools, not to eliminate our job, not to eliminate those roles, but to, you know, I think Donnie Shimoda said basically, it's all these tools in our tool belt, right? So now we have so many of these great technology tools, just embrace them. And I agree with you, change is, is difficult. I mean, auditors, I mean, don't like to change. I'm a CPA, I'm an auditor, it's very, very difficult to change. Uh, but we have to embrace all of these technologies because by embracing them, it'll make us more efficient, it'll increase margins, increase profitability, and coupled with staff shortages in our industry today and all of the distractions that we have going on around that, we need to embrace change. Technology is one of those things that scares a lot of people, not, not just accountants, but a lot of professionals, uh, whether it's because they, they just don't know how something works or in some cases maybe they're afraid it's going to cause them to lose their job. Yep. So what do you say to CPAs or other professionals to, to make them more comfortable with new technology? I, I Look, I just literally say, technology will not take someone's job away. In fact, when our profession a few years ago started to migrate to the cloud, you know, I looked at internal IT professionals within a firm, they all thought they were all going to lose their jobs. I will tell you today, we are 100% in the cloud, we have a hell of a lot more internal IT professionals working with us today than we have ever had. Right? So it simply puts people in a different role, in a different position. The type of things that you were doing are now done by technology. It makes us better. It takes us out of you know, the, the, the crunching the numbers, the, 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 the tasks that we shouldn't be doing. Let's, let's better put us in a position to better advise our clients, right? Use what we went to school to learn how to do. No CPA, no accountant went to school to learn how to take a number off a box, you know, one on a W-2 and input that same number into tax software to be gross wages. We didn't go to school to learn how to do that. We never learned how to do that in school. We didn't learn that until we got into the profession. We learned all those manual tasks. And quite frankly, a lot of people forgot about all the other things, that foundation. They knew it when they took the CPA exam, but then there was no, you know, application for it in the industry. We're going back to that. Hence the, the changes to the CPA exam, right? To be more relevant in our profession as to what we do in our profession today.
One of the new service areas that many CPAs are getting involved with is ESG, environmental, social, and governance reporting. I asked Jim about this. We are perfectly positioned as CPAs to own that space. And that's what we are trying to do in our profession, right? Why? We, we love to measure stuff. We love to report stuff. We love to say, here's what it will be. Here's what it's going to take to get there. And we are great at memorializing that in the form of test work, in the form of uh, reports, things like that. So our entire profession is poised and positioned to take advantage of this. You heard our speaker talk earlier today about how Europe has embraced ESG, ESG reporting, sustainability for the longest time. It is just starting to get traction here in our country. And if, you know, if a sole practitioner says, oh, that's not me, those are just big companies, public companies, you know, it's not gonna affect me, I will, I will argue it will affect you. Because take a look at your clients. We're starting to hear from our clients that they are getting uh, request from their customers, some of their largest customers, about their ESG policies. We had a client last week that Kraft Foods reached out to them and said, we want a copy of your ESG policy. policy. And this is a small, closely held business. We, uh, t the type of client that most you know, CPAs in, at the Injury Society would actually be handling. So it involves everyone, and when your clients are asking the question, you need to be able to, to react. You know, I, like, I, even re I retract that. Don't even let your clients ask you know, ask the question. Go to your clients, be proactive and right. say, hey, if you're approached by a customer or someone needing ESG, ESG reporting, let me know. Right. And that goes into the advisory services that you're always preaching. Absolutely. So whether it's sustainability, diversity, yep. equity, inclusion, yep. ESG, technology, mm -hmm. all of these things, again, they're, they're opportunities, they're not burdens. Absolutely. They're not, they're they're not a box checking no, exercise. Look, look, we want to remain relevant in our profession for a long time, right? We want that next generation of accountants to, to have the lifestyle that the generation before them w was able to have, right? And maybe that generation before us, they were able to have that lifestyle as a result of compliance work, the audits, the reviews, the compilations, the business valuations, the tax work. It's totally changing going forward. You want a sustainable practice, you need to look at advisory services because that's where it's at. If I'm a young professional in a firm today, I'm gonna look to differentiate myself, right? I'm not gonna, just, I'm not gonna stand in line. I'm not gonna do tax returns for nine years, 10 years, just so I can finally become a partner in the firm. Right. How do you differentiate yourself? You can do it by embracing some of these advisory services, take the lead on some of these things. And uh, to me, that's your fast track to becoming partner in the firm. There's certainly no doubt that technology and technical skills are important but I wanted to follow up on Keisha's remarks on upskilling. Isn't there research that suggests something as simple as just reading business books? People who read business books on a regular basis actually make more money than people who oh, don't. Well, if that's the case, let me go out and buy yeah. some more business books right now. Maybe you can write one. Uh, and make, <laughs> hey, there we go. Uh, but I am an avid reader. Yeah. I, I am an absolute avid reader. And sometimes you have to read something, what I would call outside of your discipline, or something that is going to challenge your, your mindset. And I think, you know, reading those uh, business books or really trying to understand their story Stories. I like to read people's stories, uh, their autobiographies. What, were the, what was their genesis? How did they get here? I just read Viola Davis's uh, autobiography, which is fascinating, sometimes scary, uh, just to know what she navigated in order to be at the top of her game. That's not accounting. However, those same characteristics are necessary. Resilience, making sure you're upskilling yourself. She went to drama school. She didn't just fall out of the sky and say, I, I'm, you know, I have a great voice and a great presence right, and right. I'm gonna be a magnificent actor. No, she actually upskilled herself and moved into a different direction, moved in a different city, worked in different regional theaters. Those things are things that we can apply here in the profession. What are we doing? Are we getting some new skills? Are we going uh, to some new environments? This is why I love it, a convention atmosphere. You get to interact with so many people. So I think reading different you know, periodicals, uh, stretching your brain cells, thinking differently, and even I've gone to my podiatrist and he said, even walk in a different direction. So I walk every morning because that helps my physical and mental well-being. He said, but don't do the same path. And he said, don't even walk on the same side of the sidewalk. Just to change your brain, just to do something different. And so those are things I think will keep our brain cells receptive for the changes that are happening and that will allow us to pivot. And those are things that are pretty simple. Right. I think everybody can walk and everybody can go get a book, hopefully, right. uh, to try to make your brain think differently so you can respond differently to all these changes that are happening. Right. I've read even um, eating with your opposite hand. Opposite hand, can, which can help with that. doesn't always help for me. No, it's things a fall off. Yeah. Things fall off and I try to uh, exhibit grace at all times and it's not very graceful. 
but I thought about it and Very I true. tried it. <laughs> That's a health thing, right? That counts for something. Right. So it's interesting you mentioned the book um, about Viola Davis, because I, I think sometimes a uh, business book means different things to different people. Like I, I've been asked, you know, what's your favorite business book? And mine, I don't really think is necessarily a business book, but it's Moneyball, mm -hmm. which is, I'm a huge baseball fan. And, you know, I followed the transition from a very traditional model in baseball to one that's more analytics driven. Mm -hmm. And I think just that idea of taking something that had been around for over a hundred years, and essentially blowing it up and being kind of an outlier and then everyone. Everybody's doing it. Right, and I think there's so many applications to accounting mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to something like that. So I guess, you know, um, a, a business book is in the eye of the beholder. Right, and I think, you know, for me, one of the eye-opening books uh, was really around the smartest guys in the room yes. when they talk about yeah. Enron mm -hmm. and because I'm an auditor, in my soul, that's what I've done. And reading that, I was always thinking, well, why didn't they look at this? And why was it that here? Why wasn't that here? And so sometimes those books will stretch you to think differently about how you do business because you get to see kind of a case study to say, wow, that wasn't the right approach, but in the Moneyball perspective, that's innovation. Mm -hmm, exactly. And that is transformative. I asked Keisha what companies should do to help employees develop their non-technical skills such as emotional intelligence and communications, and what employees can do to improve these skills themselves. For the companies, they need to create a culture that non-technical skills are valued, because at the end of the day, we're gonna get our technical skills. You know, People are coming to this convention just so they can get their CPE. They're gonna get the technical skill. What is harder to get are those non-technical skills. So companies need to provide opportunities for people to get that non-technical a type of what I would call polish. Uh, you have the technical skills, but how do you really communicate well with others? How do you resolve conflict? Most folks are in a client service business, in a client service model. They need to resolve conflict. They need to work in teams. Creating a culture and creating a culture that embraces a growth mindset where you really are saying, my innate abilities aren't the only thing that allows me to be successful. I can do some hard work, I can do some strategies, I can learn something. That's really a growth mindset, a learning mindset. And so companies really need to show some things that are actionable. You know, how many of their training sessions are around non-technical skills? Are they building that throughout the organization uh, for every level? All right, we can't say, well, we'll wait until their manager and they'll get those skills. No, 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 we need that first year staff person to know, we need the intern to know. Exactly. And so building that culture throughout the organization and then for individuals, do your own self-assessment. And sometimes looking in the mirror mm -hmm. can be a little hard, but you know better than anybody else where you need some enhancement. So if you do shy away from conflict and you need to learn how to have a crucial conversation, Figure out, are there ways, are there books, uh, are there training sessions, are there partners or peers or mentors that you can talk to to say, this is an area that, ooh, I'm not as comfortable in. In a technical setting, I can go get three hours of CPE on telling me how to account for leases. But, you know, is there really a session that talks about crucial conversations and emotional intelligence? And so sometimes, one, the individual needs to do a self-assessment and then think about are there some peer relationships or some mentoring relationships that will help with that development because the longer you stay in the profession, the more those types of skills are gonna help you maintain in the profession. The technical skills will get you in the door. Mm -hmm. If you know the tax code, you know the tax law, you know the state laws, you know the accounting guidance, you know the auditing standards, that gets you in the door. That's what people expect you to do. But to deliver high quality client service, you need to know how to interact with people. You need to know how to be empathetic. You need to know how to communicate well. That's what keeps people in the profession. That's what keeps the longevity with your clients. So I think the companies have to have a culture and then the individuals have to do a little bit of self-assessment and then think about those other pieces that can complement uh, their learning in those areas. During his convention session, Gene talked a lot about inflation. I wanted to get his thoughts on how inflation might impact the prices that CPA firms charge their clients. Funny that you asked that because I run a professional services firm and we have not increased our rates yet. Still paying pretty much the same. I don't think that's going to last. And the reason why is that this whole great resignation thing, which is a very annoying term and I'm sick of it, mm. but um, employees are leaving and they're just leaving for more money. 
because it's out there. Right. So you can leave a job where you're making 80 grand a year because there is a similar job that's going to pay you 90 grand a year or 95 grand a year. That's happening across all industries, and it's going to be happening. It's happening right now in the financial services industry. So ultimately, accounting firms are going to be seeing those loss of employees, a turnover of employees. And when that happens, they're going to their whole wage. The minute you start paying one you know, staff accountant or senior accountants a certain elevated wage to get them because you need that person, um, that has an impact on your payroll across the board, and then that's going to have an impact on the rates that you're going to charge your clients. Right. So we ain't getting we ain't getting away from it. Nobody's giving us a, a, a buy right. on this inflation thing. Well, one positive, I guess, to raising prices, and we've heard this from a number of managing partners, is, you know, obviously the last couple of years we've heard so much about workload. And one way to get rid of maybe bad underpaying clients yep is to raise your rates and you keep the good paying clients. It is. it is. The other thing I also have to say is and I know like, you know, you know, this organization has a lot of smaller accounting firms, mm -hmm. you know, that yep. you know, if your if your rate per hour is 150 bucks an hour and you raise it to 160 bucks an hour, it's probably going to go mostly unnoticed by most of your clients. Right. So it's you do have a lot of wiggle room, and I think that myself, like our rates in our firm, we average about 175 bucks an hour. And I'm thinking, like, you know, if I just started charging 185 bucks an hour, I, I'm I'm not going to lose any clients over that. And if somebody really yells, I could be like, fine, we'll keep you at 175. Right. And that's important because as I'm going to be paying my people a little bit more, I'm seeing that inevitably happening. I, I don't think it's going to be too hard to pass on those rate increases to clients. They're all expecting it. Let's end on a high note by hearing what Gene and Scott are optimistic about for the coming year. This is going to sound really strange, but um, I'm optimistic about a downturn in the economy. <laughs> and people say, like, you might have to clarify. Yeah, that. <laughs> I might have to say, like, no, okay, obviously a recession isn't great, or, or you know, you know, less business isn't great, or whatever. But um, taking a deep breath on the economy, having a, a little bit of a pause, right, over the next six months, which is what we're kind of heading into, it gets, it, it, it gives the entire world economy time to catch up. Okay, so you know we're suffering with inflation issues right now because there is not enough supply and an over demand for certain things. When demand gets cut back just you know a little bit, um, that is going to have a positive impact on inflation. That will depress price a little bit and maybe bring things back into order so that the rest of production can catch up to it. So I think that's kind of good. The second thing is labor. I mean, every company I talk to are freaking out about getting new employees for their businesses. Yeah. They can't find and they get whatever. You know, I can promise you that if there is a pullback, you know, in the economy. Larger companies, they're going to be cutting and trimming their payrolls because that's what large companies do. Mm -hmm. I think that's like a huge opportunity for a lot of small and mid-sized companies. Some of that talent that they weren't able to get over the past few years, they, they could very well be coming available. And if you've got the capital, you can snap it up. I know that sounds weird, but it's that actually I think is an opportunity. In as much as we have challenges that we confront today, if you step back and look at the global economic picture, who would you rather be than us? It's an economy that's proven its resiliency. It's a corporate sector that's proven its innovation. I think our higher education in particular is a real source of national competitive strength. I hope we can invest in all those things, but I like the hand that we've been dealt as a country. We're better off than the rest of the world. Well, that's a perfect note to end on. This is just a sampling of the thought leadership and learning that takes place at the NJCPA convention and expo. So if you didn't make it this year, plan to join us next year, June 13th through 16th, at the Borgata in Atlantic City. Thank you all for listening and watching.